Hi everyone, thanks for joining this talk. I'm Sebastian Estrund, I'm here to tell you about MPK-PKS kernel compartmentalization. Or rather, how we can use memory protection keys to compartmentalize the Linux kernel and make it more secure. So let me start out tell you a bit about my background. So <clears throat> at the moment, I work as an offensive security researcher at Intel IPostorm Spear, uh, which is a team that focuses on uh, offensive security research and developing mitigations. Before joining Intel, I was a PhD student at uh, Fusec Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, uh, where my research topics include operating system defenses. Uh, I worked on side channels of uh, transient execution attacks, so was involved with real MDS. Besides that, I've been working on fuzzing and uh, compilers in general. Uh, so nowadays, my day-to-day -day duties include uh, working on static analysis of microcode, um, looking at operating system defenses such as this one, and in general, just looking at new hardware features and how we can use them for security. <clears throat> so as you might have guessed from the title of this talk, it's all about compartmentalization. So why do you need compartmentalization in Linux kernel? So the first observation is that nowadays there's a lot of uh, third-party code that runs in ring zeros that's not necessarily like upstream in the main kernel tree. So think of things like drivers or eBPF packet filters all running in ring zero. So suppose there's some kind of bug in any of these uh, programs that are running in ring zero, say a memory error, uh, an attacker could potentially like disclose all the memory available on the machine just from a single bug, which is not really ideal. So the observation here is for a lot of these things, there's no, uh, it's not really necessary for to be able to access all the memory when you run in these kind of contexts. Contexts, so for example, uh, eBPF scripts, there's no need for them to really like be able to access the direct mapping, access all memory. And then there's obviously the elephant in the room, transit execution attack. So these. Uh, uh, these guys, like even despite there not being any actual memory errors or bugs in the program, attacker could still uh, abuse this kind of third party like code that runs in ring zero and like execute gadgets from them to disclose memory through transit execution gadgets. So what I want to propose today is uh, to implement a kind of kernel compartmentalization using new hardware features to make it lightweight. Step back to transient execution attacks again, uh, since uh, as I mentioned, the elephant in the room, like Spectre, Meltdown, and uh, MDS and friends. Uh, these have been quite a headache for the kernel community to probably mitigate. Uh, so th there's so many of these things that like already wrapping your head around what they all do and like probably checking if something's probably mitigated is kind of a pain. And it doesn't help that some like more heavyweight blanket mitigations that are, have been proposed are really hard to implement. So one example I can mention is the core scheduling uh, mitigation, which is partially upstream in the kernel. Uh, and basically what it does, it pins a certain security domain to a, to a core. So uh, any process that runs on whatever uh, like SMT threads or hybrid threads on that core need to be in the same security domain. Obviously a big part of uh, core scheduling would be to uh, protect the kernel so you can have <coughs> uh, two co-located threads, one running in user space and one in kernel space, uh, and then like uh, leak stuff across threads. Uh, this is a part of core scheduling that hasn't been upstreamed yet, as far as I know, because it's uh, simply the costs, performance costs are really high and it's really tricky, I think, to get right. So as a result, uh, different ven vendors have simply opted to disable functionality, such as <clears throat> some uh, BSDs uh, disabled uh, hybrid trading altogether, uh, and uh, most Linux distros have disabled uh, unprivileged BPF code after Spectre BHB was uh, made public. So I want to go into too much details on Spectre how it works, but essentially what the attacker can do is mispredict the branch predictor so that uh, you can access uh, out of uh, out of bounds array access in the speculative execution and then leak the secret that you obtain through it uh, from, from that uh, through some microarchitectural side effects. So basically in, uh, in the cache. So you can access some uh, some out of bounds things, so arbitrary memory access, leak the secret that's accessed there into the cache and then yeah, you do a cache attack to, to leak the actual secret. <clears throat> so in general, these kind of attacks have the following format. You prepare the system by flushing some buffer, then you do the attack which access some 
some secrets and leaves a microarchitectural trace, for example, in the cache. And then you do a timing attack to see, okay, for example, which cache entries ha have been accessed here. So you have uh, the flush, after you have flushed all the buffers, made the system into state <clears throat> that is known, you can time any changes in, in the state and then see what uh, secret has been leaked. This is a very high level overview and uh, hand wavy overview of how this works, but just to be on the same page to see like uh, if you want some more details, there's a lot of other presentations going in depth on how these uh, transit execution attacks work. So what I also wanted to note is that compartmentalization is already present in Linux kernel. There have been a few efforts uh, like endeavors trying to do some kind of compartmentalization uh, in the context of security. So the first one that comes to mind is KPTI or kernel page table uh, isolation, which was the original uh, mitigation uh, proposed for, for Meltdown. Uh, more more uh, recently, Google has kind of taken this idea and made it more like generic. So it can be used for a lot of uh, <clears throat> mitigating like these kind of similar transit execution attacks. Uh, simply, it, it works by having different address spaces. Uh, so KPTI had like different address space for user space and the kernel because they want to avoid uh, kernel leaks uh, through meltdown. ASI uh, address space isolation uh, can do this inside the kernel, especially for paths from the hypervisor, so that <clears throat> when when someone does a, a exits from a virtual machine, like in a cloud provider, for example, that they can't access. Uh, any arbitrary memory if there's some kind of new uh, speculative execution uh, gadgets available. Another example of some compartmentalization is kernel lockdown or secure boot that kind of just locks down the system that so that uh, people can, <coughs> that even the root user can't uh, modify. So suppose the root user is compromised, they can't get like arbitrary access to everything. And then there's uh, the third kind of uh, kind of compartmentalization endeavor I can think of as uh, confidential compute. So think of hardware features like <coughs> SGX that uh, allows kind of uh, confidential processes to run where the, the host, the machine that's running it, can't mess with whatever is running in that kind of compartmentalized uh, SGX enclave. And more recently, this, uh, this idea has been uh, generalized to TDX or SCV, uh, where you can run a whole virtual machine with kind of this hardware guaranteed walled garden around it. So that suppose you have a malicious hypervisor or cloud provider that can't read what's going on inside your virtual machine. So this is just an example of how like these kind of compartmentalization things are actually used today. <clears throat> Another thing I want to note is that many of these are quite like heavyweight and typically reserved for virtualization uh, where you like enter exit a virtual machine, which is already quite expensive. So, and it doesn't happen that often. So even if, so you typically like need to switch address spaces or something uh, like that, which is quite expensive, but if it doesn't happen all too often, it's the overhead is like, it's acceptable. But suppose you want to do this inside the kernel for like these small, more smaller domains, then yeah, the overhead of doing context switching, like switching address spaces becomes quite significant. So in this talk, what I want to do is propose like leveraging some new hardware features to kind of achieve something similar, like similar compartmentalization, but uh, especially like similar to KPTI or ASI, but much more lightweight. So that brings us to memory protection keys. Uh, so there's two different uh, implementation of protection keys for Intel, like PKU for use space and PKS for uh, supervisor modes. Protection keys for supervisor is what we'll be focusing on for the kernel uh, compartmentalization. In essence, what uh, this hardware feature allows you to do is uh, override the permission in the page table entry. So you can, suppose you have a writable page uh, that's mapped as like writable, accessible. Uh, what you can do is for a certain like uh, domain, like you do define domain key, you can override all the permissions for all the pages that fall under that domain and disable write access, for example, simply to write through writing to an MSR. So the benefit of this is that there's, <clears throat> you can change page table permissions or achieve something like similar to, to KPTR or ASI, 
without having to change address spaces. So no need to invalidate the, the TLB or change the CR, uh, which makes it a lot faster than uh, <clears throat> than any of uh, like yes, fully switching address spaces. So these hardware features like PKU, so protection keys for uh, user land have been uh, user mode have been available has been available for a few generations, and uh, protection keys for supervisor has recently been uh, released on fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors. So let's delve into this hardware feature PKS. Uh, I will give you like a kind of overview how it works. Uh, <clears throat> so I already mentioned you have like these uh, domains of protection keys. So essentially what you can do is for each page table entry in your page table layout, you uh, insert the protection key in like, so, so some of the bits that have previously been reserved uh, now contain like a protection key. So normally if you think of a page table entry, you have like, you have these few bits, right? With some permissions, so execute, disable, you can do read, write, user, supervisor, and then the actual like uh, the <coughs> physical address, like how to do the address uh, resolution is in the rest of the bits and so, so and some other things, I guess. But essentially what we use a few uh, bits in here that uh, define like the protection domain of a certain page. And the nice thing is like, so it's it's four bits essentially in the p, uh, page table entry <clears throat> that defines for which uh, to which domain a certain page belongs, and then what we can do is uh, override the permissions that have been defined in the page table entry through an MSR. So you can say uh, access disable for certain protection key uh, or write disable. So as I already said, mentioned, there, there's four bits uh, that we use to associate the page to a like page table entry to a domain. Uh, which gives us max 16 keys. Uh, and then we have an MSR with 32 bits because you have a write disable access disable for every single uh, domain. Just just to give you some in-depth information on how this works. <clears throat> and like, so, so essentially what you can have is you have a, you assign a certain domain to a page and you can overwrite the page table entries in the corresponding index in, a, uh, in an MSR. So for more uh, detailed explanation of how, how this all works. Have a look at IRS and Rick's uh, uh, Linux Plumbers talk from 2021. They explain how they implemented this for the Linux kernel. So how can we use uh, protection keys for supervisor for compartmentalization in the kernel? So one of the things is like, okay, what do we even want to compartmentalize? Uh, so previously PKS, uh, the protection keys for supervisor have been used to protect some sensitive areas in the kernel from the kernel itself. So simply like <clears throat> if you're, suppose there's a memory error in the kernel, you don't want it to be able to <clears throat> leak certain like super sensitive information such as crypto keys. So previously like uh, the <clears throat> PKS has been used to like basically like yeah, deny access to, to certain small parts of the kernel or disable writing to something like page table entries, uh, to the, like the, the page tables or persistent memory. So for compartmentalization, we kind of want to turn this around. We don't want to protect small parts of the kernel from kernel itself. We want to protect the whole kernel itself while executing in a certain selective small part of code. So just to visualize it, right? So <clears throat> we normally, when, when you want to protect some secret, you say, okay, uh, map a certain secret area with a certain protection key and disable access to that when you're not in a critical section. Now what we want to do is in the general case, like, okay, have access to all the memory in the kernel, but if you're executing in some critical, like some section that doesn't need access to all kernel memory, such as eBPF or so some other small part, uh, then we disable access to all the normal kernel memory and only keep the minimal set of pages that we need. So such as the stack and the data that it really needs to access available. <clears throat> Another way of putting it is we move from a deny list approach to an allow list approach. I think that's the kind of the easiest way to see this. Uh, <clears throat> so I identified a few targets where something like this would be possible, right? Where we can make like most of the kernel memory non-accessible <clears throat> uh, and just keep a small set like limited set that it actually like just needs to be access, be able to access in that context. So one of the things I looked at was <clears throat> where I implemented this for, for eBPF. So eBPF is this 
uh, virtual machine basically that runs inside the kernel in ring zero <clears throat> that can intercept, like it can hook into function. You can have it run as a response when you get a network packet and a bunch of other things. But it's a very, like it's a limited virtual machine that uh, only should access like a uh, very, yeah, a limited set of memory. So here it's something, it's a nice obvious uh, candidate to kind of try this kind of compartmentalization where we disallow it to read arbitrary kernel memory. So suppose there's a bug in there, like <clears throat> then if, if an attacker can somehow try to like control a point and read arbitrary memory, we get a fault if we try to read some something that's not uh, some arbitrary mem kernel memory. Uh, Another thing I looked at was uh, using PKS for drop-in replacement for address space isolation. So I'll talk about this a bit more uh, later in the presentation. But uh, you can essentially like give uh, like similar guarantees as address space isolation uh, using PKS without having to switch between address space and doing a full context switch. Uh, so I also like yeah I've been thinking about some other thing targets that we can do this kind of compartmentalization. So if and if you have any suggestions where we can can try to like uh, demo this out, then uh, we'll be super happy to chat about that later. So let's go get into how does this actually work? How can we do uh, compartmentalization with PKS? Uh, as already mentioned, like you have you basically have uh, these two domains. Uh, so for uh, clarity, just let's just define these things. It's like we have a privileged domain and a non-privileged one. So you have a key zero, the pr privileged key, and non-privileged key is key one. Uh, in privileged, uh, when you're in privileged, uh, like in a privileged domain, you can access all kernel memory. Like so, basically, everything that's yellow and green here should be accessible when you're in the like uh, privileged domain. If you're in the non-privileged domain, so think of the that's the, the more restrictive one where you're in like inside eBPF or uh, kind of enter like address space isolation section, then you're only supposed to be able to access like the, the things marked in green or mapped on your P, uh, key one. So really the minimal set of memory. And if you access like when you're in the non-privileged uh, domain and try to access anything, like for example, here, like the kernel text, you should get a fault. <clears throat> so how, okay. As already mentioned, like if you're in the privileged domain, you should be able to access everything. So that's uh, fairly simple. We just keep the normal like mappings uh, as we have in the kernel. That's like normal kernel operation. So suppose we're in the like some memory management code. We obviously want to be able to access like we we need to be able to access a lot like all the memory. So then we're just in the we're in the privileged domain. Uh, we don't need to do anything special. Like we keep all the uh, access disable write disable bits to zero like we don't want to overwrite any page table permissions when we're in the privileged kernel domain simple enough but then suppose we enter like a ebpf script or uh, something else and we want to switch to the non-privileged domain where it's more restrictive and we can't access arbitrary memory anymore then what we do is simply for the for the pk zero so the, the one that maps all the like all the non-essential like all, all the, yeah, basically all the kernel memory that's not super strictly essential for the critical section that we're in. Uh, we said like override the write disable and access disable bit. Um, so we set them to one. So essentially this, this tells us, okay, anything that's yellow in this picture here uh, will be unaccessible while only the green stuff is still accessible. So for P uh, key one, we don't override the permissions for PK zero we override the page shield permission, so it's all disabled. So that, uh, that basically gives us access to the minimal set of memory that we need. Uh, here it's obviously like it's very important to keep in mind that uh, when you're executing stuff, there's a minimal set of things that you always need to have uh, mapped. So think of like the, just normal like the stack. So if you uh, operate like yeah, just execute normal code like it needs to have a stack access uh, another thing to keep in mind the uh, interrupt stack so if you get the interrupt while inside the non-privileged domain it's still it you need to be able to handle it so uh, there's a few like these pages that really need to be to be mapped actually and accessible so just to visualize how to switch between the privilege mode and the non-privileged mode you basically have these uh, write disable access disable uh, bits in the in the register 
you if you're in the privilege mode they're all zeros once you move into the non privilege mode you set for pk zero so the one the like uh, the default one that all kernel memories associated with so uh, you should override the bits so say make them non accessible while we always keep the pk one like the just for that's uh, should be accessible in the non privileged domain they we all never overwrite the permissions there uh, which has as an effect okay <clears throat> once we move into the non privileged mode we disable access for any pk0 memory but still keep access to the pk pk1 uh, memory so the green stuff is still accessible the yellow stuff is not accessible easy enough right so getting this to work there's a few challenges um, <clears throat> like uh, how to get this uh, compartmentalization to work so in general there's a few problems so <clears throat> For like ideally we would like to do this kind of compartmentalization all over the kernel right like so I mentioned drivers before uh, but it turns out this is not really not easy because in a lot of places memory access are not really localized so you need to know beforehand uh, which pages should be accessible inside your like your uh, non-privileged domain uh, so <clears throat> so suppose you have a driver that access like memory all over the uh, place in the kernel you need to make sure that all allocations that are made for that are actually mapped uh, under the right uh, domain key so so that's something that's yeah it's it's a bit tough in the general sense uh, uh, th I, there's a solution for this right so you can temporarily like uh, disable the, the, the like this the uh, defense and act, like allow temporary access to arbitrary memory so like if people are familiar with smap this is essentially how it works right so when you're in a se uh, section that really needs to access uh, 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 user mode user memory there right so, uh, with smap then you dis simply disable the feature uh, but yeah then uh, so so in, in general like yeah it's memory access like overall like overall in the kernel are not really always localized so you can do this compartmentalization everywhere uh, and then like the, the other question is how can we determine the areas that need to be accessed from within a domain which is also not really easy so you need to know like beforehand what memory like is accessed when you're in a certain uh, when, when you enter into your uh, <coughs> non-privileged uh, domain uh, so for for memory that's allocated with while well, you're inside like the the non-privileged domain is quite easy just like you make sure that everything that you <clears throat> allocate is mapped under the, the right uh, domain key but suppose it accesses like some pointers from somewhere else and tries to like access some struct with pointers in it like yeah you need to make sure that all this stuff is still is accessible so in the general sense like implementing this for something like the compartmentalization for drivers is not really feasible so that's um, i started with like these more self-contained things like uh, ebpf or uh, as a drop-in replacement for address space isolation so yeah that's uh, that's basically the gist of it so ideally yes we should be able to do it for everything I think in practice it's uh, it's very hard I think to to do this in a general sense so let's have a look at the the first use case that I implemented where I've tried this out for so PKS uh, eBPF for BPF isolation uh, so as already mentioned BPF it's a uh, a kind of a virtual machine that runs inside the Linux kernel at ring zero so it can run these kind of bytecode BPF bytecode uh, that typically use for like packet filters and all kinds of other things you can do it like to uh, for pro use it for profiling like uh, instrumenting function calls in the kernel and so on uh, the nice thing about uh, BPF is that it's a very restrictive environment so like the bytecode can't really do like uh, access arbitrary memory by itself uh, I'll come back to that in a bit so there's some caveats there and this goes through an in-kernel verifier to make sure that like the bytecode actually uh, follows all these very strict restrictions so that uh, so that like there's a verifier that checks that the bytecode that's running is actually valid and doesn't do any weird stuff but what what I want to note here there's been a few like known CVEs in the verifier itself so uh, actually it's been possible to create out of bound accesses uh, in BPF despite the verifier so it's a few edge cases that it didn't check properly and 
I did a quick uh, search for CVEs. So there's been like 80 BPF related CVEs in the past few years. So some of these uh, things, they slip through, right? Uh, in the BPF implementation. So it would be pretty nice if you can just have a blanket mitigation seed, like, okay, even if there's uh, vulnerabilities in BPF verifier, we still want to make sure that you can't access arbitrary memory in the kernel from BPF. And then, as I already mentioned earlier, like the transit execution attacks is kind of a big, uh, the big elephant in the room here, right? So uh, since <clears throat> you were able to like load user provided uh, like bytecode that's actually running in ring zero, this was a perfect target to use as like uh, running uh, transit execution gadgets. So find, like you can define your own gadget that runs in ring zero and then like the speculatively access whatever memory and then leak it. So BPF, uh, yeah, eBPF had to mitigate this uh, stuff. Like, so actually like when the bytecode is loaded, like it inserts some uh, mitigations like red polyene and other stuff. Uh, so depending a bit on the mode, how it's running. But th there's a bunch of mitigations for transit execution attacks in BPF. And obviously these things have a, a performance uh, overhead. So the nice thing here is if we can do like this blanket mitigations, could perhaps uh, get rid of these, uh, like the piecemeal mi mitigations that are for all the different specter variants. Just, just a thought. But yeah, so like I uh, already mentioned, like the B, uh, like eBPF or BPF, uh, it's a small self-contained VM, so it's a perfect target for uh, for isolation comp compartmentalization. Uh, and as I know, there's like BPF can run in two different modes. Well, you, you can also like the, set some different capabilities, but in general, there's like privilege mode and unprivileged mode. Uh, the difference is like privilege mode is that there, these filters are trusted by root and unprivileged mode could be loaded by an arbitrary user. Uh, the latter has been disabled nowadays in most distros by default because uh, there was simply no good way, I think, to mitigate this for, uh, for certain specter uh, variants. So in general, how BPF works is uh, as follows. So you have a BPF bitcode program that you load into the kernel uh, with the BPF syscall. In the kernel, there's a verifier that verifies this bitcode, uh, checks that it <coughs> actually follows all the yeah all, all the kind of requirements. It for like verifies that there's no weird looping things going on and so on, and that there's the memory access all fine. Uh, then there's a jitter, so when it's run, like it can like the <coughs> bytecode is jitted so that it's very efficient. And then you have like your BPF program that runs. Uh, it can access so-called BPF maps uh, so that it can like store memory and like as it, you can see it as a kind of a heap uh, for BPF programs. And these maps can then again be accessed from user space to retrieve uh, information that your BPF program operated on. So think of it like it can keep some counters on, see how many times has a certain function been executed and then you can read this map from user space and print out like some statistics. <clears throat> so as I already mentioned, like uh, just a quick detour here on like eBPF mitigation. So like ju just to hammer down the point that th these are like, there's a lot of these uh, transit execution attacks that need to be mitigated in eBPF. Uh, so first of all, Spectre V1. So this was mitigated through like using some array masking uh, and also having the verifier go through paths that normally can't be uh, executed. So kind of verifying speculative paths, I guess. Uh, for Spectre V2, uh, kind of the, the <clears throat> it had to do some uh, things for like indirect calls. So basically uh, it can add like red polyene, uh, uh, the red polyene mitigation for indirect calls and, and so on. And it needs to have like some kind of uh, <clears throat> fencing around uh, indirect calls. So it's it kind of, this introduces a bit of overhead. Uh, yeah, Spectre V4, the same thing, like it does some uh, fencing for, for this uh, variant of Spectre. Spectre BHB uh, is a side effect of, well, it's a result of that one being disclosed. Uh, unprivileged eBPF was disabled by default in most distros. Uh, it's already mentioned. Uh, so there, there's a whole uh, talk on BPF and Spectre mitigation. So, if you're interested in this topic, have a look at the, this presentation, BPF Spectre Mitigating Transient Execution Attacks. Uh, 
I just wanted to like list all these different things you see that okay it's it's actually like it the jitting needs to modify the, the actual code that's generated to mitigate transient execution attacks. So okay, on to how we can uh, isolate eBPF uh, with with this PKS compartmentalization I've been talking about. So here on the right, you see like the same picture we had, right? So we had like the BPF program loaded into the verifier jitted, the program can run. Uh, and then we have like this uh, compartmentalization with protection keys that I've also shown you before. So basically what we need to do is uh, we need to switch into the non-privileged domain when we enter a BPF program. So fairly simple when we call the function BPF trampoline enter or any of the other, like there's a few different ways of entering it, like depends on what the best enter set point is. But here we switch uh, into our non-privileged domain by writing to the MSR. And when we exit the BPF, we switch back to our, like our privileged domain, like normal kernel, so that we have access to everything. So for this, when you enter BPF program, you have two extra MSR writes. Uh, so, the thing to keep in mind is that so BPF uh, like like eBPF has <coughs> grown quite radically over the years, so it's uh, it, it can do a lot of stuff, right? Uh, so there, there's <coughs> it can access so some different um, memory directly because uh, it's something that you really want to use. So like the the current um, basic current thread that's executing, it can read uh, some like information from from the task thread struct uh, and basically like there, there's a bunch of uh, the helper functions also in uh, BPF to be able to access the different kinds of uh, commonly used uh, kernel data. So basically there, there's two approaches how we can uh, allow this normal BPF functionality that access like some more restricted kernel information uh, data. Uh, how we can uh, allow still allow this. So first of all is uh, we can map all these uh, pages that we need to access under uh, the, the correct P key. Uh, so basically you can ask, like <clears throat> you can map the task struct and so on, make sure that they're always mapped under this uh, protection key one so that we can access it there. Uh, another approach is to dynamically disable the protection once <clears throat> once we go through one of these uh, eBPF helpers that can, uh, can read uh, these kernel data structures. So, uh, Obviously, the first approach is way more performant because the, the second approach, we always have to keep switching uh, uh, like the MSR content, so it's not really ideal. Uh, so basically, you have like these helper functions that can that can really read different things in the kernel. There's also like some helper function eBPF to read arbitrary kernel memory, but uh, then you simply need to do this dynamically disable the protection, but it's not that commonly used. Uh, the second kind of memory that BPF programs can access. I already mentioned like the BPF maps, so these obviously need to be mapped with the right permissions, like under uh, key one. Then uh, there's some things known as performance buffers and per task storage. So they're all very similar to this. It's, it's just like memory areas that need to be actually mapped under the right permission. Uh, so yeah, I already mentioned that some of these uh, BPF helpers that can be called from the kernel need to access uh, <coughs> arbitrary, like can access arbitrary memory data. These shouldn't usually not be called by uh, by most BPF programs. So, but so it's I think it's fine to dynamically disable the uh, mitigation for these, like similar to like SMAP. But yeah, that's just something to keep in mind to keep compatibility. So ideally, I think the the way to go forward with this is to define a special like uh, more restrictive BPF mode, which uh, when you use like this uh, PKS mitigation where it actually can't use this at all. So in general, like the memory that uh, BPF programs can access is kind of uh, restricted. So there's like a few types of pointers that like can <coughs> can be like in registers during the BPF execution. So uh, you can access like a BPF context, uh, the, the map that I was talking about. So in the map values then uh, can access like the stack. Uh, it can access network packets. So these you need to make sure that these are mapped under the right uh, protection key. So that's uh, luckily these are all allocated with like some uh, specific uh, allocation function. So it's pretty easy to uh, 
was pretty, pretty easy to modify it to be able to like access these things from a BPF context. Uh, same thing with uh, the sockets. So yeah, th this is what, the first one I implemented. It's uh, actually a, it was a fair, fairly like doable to get it, get it up and running uh, for for like the most like BPF scripts I was uh, testing this out with. And so just some observations from uh, from implementing it and running. So the overhead uh, for this mitigation in for eBPF is obviously like the right MSR. Like when we need to enter BPF, we do a right MSR. When we exit, we do another right MSR. However, like writing an MSR, it's not super expensive. Like so, it, I think it's like matter of like the ratio between like how big the BPF script is versus like the the cost of an MSR write, but most if they do a bit of work, like the MSR write is like really neg negligible. So I did some initial benchmarking basically for this, and uh, so I, <clears throat> I did a, P, a BPF uh, filter that uh, traces all syscalls that are uh, run from the kernel, and then I run like LNBench, this known uh, benchmarking suite for the kernel, and the over like the overhead of doing this write MSR like on entering X to be the BPF filter was like about 1%, like very noticeable. So it's uh, that's actually promising. Um, another thing that uh, we could do, like <clears throat> if we have this uh, function, like if we have this uh, compiled ventilation is to disable the BPF mitigations for, for Spectre and Friends. So since it can't access <clears throat> arbitrary memory ex uh, like uh, inspective execution anymore, it's something that we can, we could think about disabling the mitigations to just get the performance speed up. So basically, like what we've seen here is that uh, using PKS is a kind of a nice uh, way of uh, achieving this kind of compartmentalization. So a nice thing is that it's very compatible with uh, existing um, compartmentalization uh, techniques such as ASI. I'll get back to it in a bit, but you can basically get the same kind of uh, security primitives as when switching like uh, address space altogether. So I just want to point people to Google's address space isolation presentation since I've been re referencing this a lot uh, from Linux Plumber Conference in Dublin 2022, uh, where they based like it's a, it's a yeah, generalization of KPTI where you switch address spaces when you go into a, like a, a address space isolation critical section. So you basically, uh, Oh yeah, it's it's very similar to what I mentioned before right here with PKS compartmentalization. You keep a minimal set of memory map that you actually need to be able to access. Uh, so in contrast to like uh, switching address space at PKS, like it's uh, it's pretty lightweight. It's just MSR uh, right rather than uh, than doing a full uh, address space switch, full context switch, and and it's so as a Kind of side effect of it being like it's pretty flexible. We can use it in a lot more places than uh, it, like performance is less of a, a thought here. Like it, it's not super expensive to to do this switch. So then uh, let me also talk about like besides EPPF, I did another implementation. So drop-in replacement for address space isolation using PKS. Uh, so ASI, as I already mentioned, basically like it's. Uh, the idea is pretty simple. You split the memory into a privileged, unprivileged domain uh, in the kernel. You have two sets of page tables. Uh, the privileged one is like the normal kernel mappings, just as I mentioned with the PKS uh, EBPF implementation. And then you have the unprivileged, which has a minimal set of page, uh, pages that you need to be able to access. So essentially get uh, something that looks like this. So like on the left, you have the privileged address space that can access all the memory. And on the right, you only access like certain parts that are really necessary. Uh, once you enter into this restricted uh, like domain, kind of you do an ASI enter call, which switches that uh, address space, does a context switch, and ASI, ASI exit uh, yeah, switches back to the normal uh, privilege one. Uh, and yeah, of course, any memory that you need to be able to access in this, uh, inside this domain here, in, inside the unprivileged one needs to be mapped with, uh, yeah, you need to keep track of that it's actually mapped in that page table uh, in the unprivileged one. So we basically add an extra flag to kmalloc and vmalloc. So if we <clears throat> look at how it works, you have this ASI enter that 
like if, if you're like in privileged kernel work, so <clears throat> for example, the memory management scheduler, then once you go into some, some other workload, you enter the, the unprivileged domain, so you switch to CR3s and then you do your workload. So for example, uh, some hypervisor work, right? And then once you exit, you need to go into this privileged work again, you do an ASI exit. It's very similar to what I mentioned with the PKS, but this is uh, that you switch the address space, uh, like the CR3 register instead of writing an MSR. So basically what I did is uh, implemented like the, an ASI-like uh, drop-in replacement with PKS. So it's exactly the same as, uh, like, uh, it's very similar to ASI, but instead of doing a CR3 switch, I switched to MSR as I already discussed before. Uh, so there's no need to keep two sets of page tables. We can do everything in, in one. We just need to make sure that the uh, domain key, the protection key is actually the, the right one. So instead of mapping something to other page table, we need to, if you do a mapping with <coughs> this uh, flag, uh, we need to make sure that the protection key is the right one. So the GFPX non-sensitive that's provided to kmalloc, then we need to make sure that this map maps with PK, P key one. Uh, yeah, so basically, it's uh, <coughs> I need to modify like kmalloc and vmalloc to use uh, to to basically handle this logic and use specific like uh, slabs or arenas basically to <coughs> for anything that should be like this non-sensitive uh, data. So one downside I need to uh, mention is that <coughs> PKS cannot overwrite execution permissions. So as already you might already have noticed this, you can overwrite access. Uh, you can disable access or write, but not execution. So the security guarantees are slightly different than uh, address space isolation, like slightly lower. But in practice, it's uh, for data uh, attacks, it's uh, it's the same guarantees. Uh, yeah, so basically, if you looked at the previous one where you switched the CR3 here, like the implementation, I did like it's a drop-in replacement, but instead of doing the CR3 switch, you switched uh, the uh, MSR which is a lot cheaper than a full CR3 switch. So in conclusion, uh, I've talked about like how it can compartmentalize the Linux kernel with protection keys for supervisor. Uh, so I start off with noting that there's a lot of third-party untrusted kernel code that runs in ring zero. Uh, so memory errors or even transit execution gadgets can allow memory disclosure. So what I presented here is a kind of framework to using protection keys for supervisor to to compartmentalize the kernel and make data non-accessible. And the first use cases I've uh, implemented prototypes for here are eBPF and address space isolation drop-in replacements. Uh, and the take-home message here is basically it's it's a lightweight uh, uh, alternative to switching address spaces. Uh, it's only writing a MSR rather than doing a full CR3 switch. So a lot easier, like cheaper and no like need for doing any TLB uh, management and so on. So it's uh, it's kind of a nifty way, I think, of doing it. Uh, and another benefit is that we can probably get rid of some um, <clears throat> mitigation in some cases, right, if you want to speed up. I haven't looked at that yet, uh, what the actual security implications are there, but it's something that uh, is for sure can keep in mind that we can get actually get the speed, uh, performance speed up with this. So that was basically all I wanted to talk about during this presentation. Uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, on Twitter or uh, by email, and I'll be here to take some questions now after the presentation. Thanks. Questions? Oh. Hey, uh, Sebastian. Uh, great talk. Um, quick question for you. Uh, if I'm on newer kernels, uh, I know in BPF tracing programs, uh, you can uh, just de you can just dereference memory uh, directly from the program, uh, and I believe that that'll compile down to something that uh, does not indirect that reference through a BPF probe read. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's only possible in in tracing programs currently. Uh, I was wondering if if you looked at that uh, during your research and if you had any mitigations for that. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Uh, yeah, so as far as I can tell, it goes through this specific wrapper. Uh, so what I've currently implemented is just disable the mitigation at that point because it's yeah, it's an arbitrary memory reference. So it's uh, I don't see a way to actually uh, like keep it supported uh, 
with, with this mitigation in place. But yeah, as you said, it's, it should only be for tracing programs. It's already a subset of possible BPF programs. So yeah, I think a uh, great question is, I think it's a limitation, but yeah, the, see the only solution is to simply temporarily disable the mitigate the, like the defense. In the case of the uh, eBPF isolation prototype, um, do you think it would be possible to essentially trigger the JIT to generate like a write MSR gadget, which would then be used to put you in the P key zero domain essentially? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So I think that's related to the question was asked in chat here, if, uh, if you can see that. so. Uh, from the JIT from uh, BPF, I actually don't know if it would be possible to generate that, but uh, let's assume that, that you can generate something that, uh, yeah, so somehow get it, then yeah, it would for sure be possible to, to generate it. Um, so it's, as I already mentioned, I think here that it's not really a mitigation that can prevent the control flow hijacking or anything else like that. So uh, yeah, for, from that specific case, like I, I I haven't looked into whether it's possible, but uh, so I, I would think it's improbable to uh, like be able to generate that from the JIT thing. But uh, yeah, you know, there can, all, can always be bugs to be able to generate this stuff. So that's one way to uh, circumvent this for sure. Thank you. As far as I understand, uh, the WR PKRU is not protected. So uh, how can you protect the unauthorized process execute the, the instruction to change the register value. And also, do you have any plan to uh, apply this to the different architecture like AMD or ARM? Okay, this is uh, two good questions. So the first one, uh, yeah, as already said, like, so it, it kind of the threat model here is that you have an attacker that has a, can find the information disclosure gadgets, right? So if if you have an attacker that already can hijack the control flow or execute arbitrary instructions, I think you're, yeah, it's kind of a lost cause if you're in ring zero and have an attacker that uh, can do that. So it's not something that I think you can realistically tackle with this. Uh, for the second part of the question to, uh, yeah, whether I want to extend it to like AMD or uh, other things. So if other vendors support like similar hardware features like MPK, it should be pretty trivial to port it, right? So. Uh, but yeah, I haven't looked into it since, uh, yeah, obviously I work at Intel. So I think the focus is uh, on getting it to work on Intel products, but uh, yeah, it's for sure something that could be extended to other uh, vendors. Um, question. So there is a limited number of bits and a limited number of keys. So ev yeah. uh, will every, like if you have multiple eBPF program, will every program allocate a separate key or you? you want to use the same key for everything. And if, so if the, the same, the same... Oh, sorry. Right. And well, if the same mechanism is applied, like not only for eBPF, let's say for some other, uh, like ACI, so they will also share the keys or there will be one hard-coded key for ACI, uh, another hard-coded key for eBPF. Yeah, so that, that's a great question, I think. So uh, currently what I have, like as I mentioned, I have like Two domains, right? So you have two different keys, the privilege and non-privilege one. So basically, all uh, eBPF programs would share the same domain. They should be, they like would be able to access each other's memory, uh, and that's yeah by design because yeah we have a limited number of domain keys. So if you would have more, like you could be able to do something like that. But for this purpose, it was not really necessary because I just want to split it up into like uh, privilege and non-privilege domains. So yeah, but that's I think that's a uh, Good point, and it's something that could actually, I guess, be used for some kind of more hierarchical uh, compartmentalization. Thank you. No more questions. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for listening. And, uh, sorry for not being able to attend this in person. Uh, it would be great to be there to meet everyone, but uh, well, it's, it is what it is. So, but yeah, thanks for the great questions, everyone.